Good evening. Welcome to um, our program, Snapshot, Snapshot from the Archives. Tonight we're celebrating American Archives Month virtually. Um, American Archives Month is an opportunity for us to raise awareness about the importance of um, archival records and also to introduce you to the city's municipal archives and its collections. Normally each year we host an in-person event, but with the pandemic, we thought we would celebrate um, this year's Archives Month with a virtual program featuring snapshots that highlight some of our favorite collections, help raise awareness about some of our lesser known collections, and tell you about some of our most satisfying projects as archivists. Um, this is also the first time we've done a live virtual event this year, so uh, bear with us if we have any little glitches, so we'll work through them. Um, our format for this evening, um, we're gonna do a presentation, uh, Kelly and I, and then we're gonna follow that with an open question and answer period at the end. If any questions come up that you think of while we're working through the presentation, you can type those in the Q&A box and we'll answer those first at the end. And then after that, we'll open up the floor for additional questions. So, um, let's see. To get things started, we, we thought we would just introduce ourselves if, if you're new to us. Um, my name is Luciana Spraker. I'm the director of the Municipal Archives. As a little background, I'm originally from New York, and this is the time of year that I really miss the Northeast with the changing uh, colors of the leaves like you see over on the left. That's right from where I grew up with the rolling hills of the Hudson River Valley. But I've lived in Savannah since 1994 when I came here to study historic preservation, and I really fell in love with Savannah and particularly the architecture and the urban landscape. I've worked with the city archives since 2005, and I enjoy the mix of archives, local history, museum work, and preservation that our office gets to tackle. I have one daughter that you see over here on the right. Um, she's a budding artist. She's now a teenager, and she no longer likes to pose with pictures like this with her mom. So she would be horrified if she knew I was showing this picture of her. Um, she's also about to surpass me in height, so that just shows you how dated this picture is, but I couldn't resist showing her off a little bit. Um, so I'd like to keep it to Kelly now. Hi, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Zakovic. Uh, I'm the archivist. I've been with the Municipal Archives for a little over four years now. Um, so I come from a military family, but really consider home to be Southwest Florida. Um, so my background is a little bit different from Luchana's, but that's kind of the one of the things that really make archives and archivists so fun is a lot of us have really different backgrounds, um, but we all kind of come together and do the same thing. So I've studied art history, modern languages, museum studies, and I have my master's in library and information science. Um, so before coming to Savannah, I was an archivist for the circus collections at the Ringling in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, so to come here and work for the Municipal Archives was a bit of a jump in subject matter, and I've been on a learning curve for a couple of years now, um, but I love it. And uh, I myself have two daughters. They're just a uh, furry. Uh, I'm a bit of a stereotypical librarian, so I usually have a house full of cats. <laughs> um, so now that you kind of know who we are as people, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about who we are as an organization and what we do. Uh, so the Municipal Archives collects, manages, preserves, and makes accessible the records documenting the city of Savannah's history. Uh, we administer the records management program and the city record center to increase the efficiency of city agencies. And we share the city's history with employees, citizens, and visitors through outreach activities. Uh, so really what this means is we serve both an internal audience of city staff as well as the general public. Uh, and one thing that really kind of makes our job in the Municipal Archives so special is since there's really just the two of us, we get to have our hands in a lot of different pots. Um, so we assist with research, we put on tours, we do exhibits, we put on programs like this, and we do a lot of educational outreach with school groups of all ages. Um, so if you have not researched with us before, we uh, have documents that document the City of Savannah's government and date of 1789. 
uh, the city of Savannah corporate limits at the time that the records were created, that stumps a lot of people, um, and city of Savannah government functions, things that reflect um, the way that the city interacts with citizens and businesses. What we do not have is a lot of uh, personal collections or things that are not government related, um, but the two largest examples of those would be the WW Law Collection and the V&J Duncan Postcard Collection. Um, all right, so Luciana, we have all these fabulous collections. Uh, what would you say are some of your favorites? So having come to Savannah for architecture, I'm really partial to our collection of architectural drawings and particularly those for City Hall. Um, we're really lucky that we get to work in City Hall, which is a fabulous building. It was completed in 1906. Um, it was designed by Hyman Wallace Wick Wickover, and it really stands as a symbol of Savannah's uh, modern spirit entering the 20th century. So here are just some samples from what's a pretty large collection of City Hall architectural drawings. On the uh, left is just a little uh, snippet of the first floor plan that shows the space that we occupy for the research room. So when City Hall is open and under normal times, if you came to visit us, this is the space you would come to do research. On the right is the upper basement uh, floor plan, so right below first floor. And um, what's really cool um, is um, we occupy part of this space, um, let me back up and actually say Wickover incorporated a lot of modern features into City Hall, like electric lights and an elevator. But as an archivist and a historian, the most impressive feature to me is this, what's, what is starred right here, the permanent record vault. And it was, um, he planned basically archival record storage in this building from the very beginning. And so the foresight to include in archives to care for City Hall's historical records in 1906 is pretty impressive. So Wickover also prepared very detailed furniture plans for every office in City Hall, including this records vault. And this is a detail of the furniture plans for the permanent records vault. And it shows you the uh, roller shelves on the bottom for the leather bound volumes, very large, that we still care for and provide access today as well as the little handled uh, drawers that held trifolded uh, paper documents. And we have just a little bit of this shelving left. Um, and in addition to that very large record vault, there were vaults that were um, built into the building throughout. Um, so each, all of the offices and departments had vaults for the records that they needed on hand uh, throughout the building. So just on these, three different sheets you see there were records vaults on every floor. So that really impresses me um, about City Hall and also excites me that we have these plans. We're currently working on a, a restoration slash renovation of the third floor and the historical records in the archives have been very important in doing that restoration work right and the archives have gotten to play a big role in acting as advisors on that project. I also really enjoy collections that get our employees excited, that get them energized about the work they do and connect them to the history of their function. Help them see how the work they're doing today matters um, to the long range history of Savannah. I think these collections help them understand where they fit into the big story and then help us better preserve their own history for future generations. Where When they see how people used to do what they do did, then they know that it's important that they help us um, preserve their history today for the future. So these are the images from the fire department's uh, photograph collection, I think are a great example of that. Um, and they're, they're also really fun photographs. On the left, we have a picture of William Boyd Smith, whose nickname was Snooky. He was a driver for the fire department in the 1920s. Also from the 1920s on the far right is a photograph of the old old fire station number five, which was at 11 East Henry Street. And I don't really know what the event is, but you have some really great uh, decked out fire vehicles. In the center is a rescue demonstration at City Hall for Fire Prevention Week in 1953. And you have the firemen that are rappelling down the front of the building. These images are great because they include both personnel and apparatus, um, but they provide a lot of information about changing technology, 
uniforms, buildings, and rescue methods. So on the surface, you like, oh, these are really cool photographs. But when you really start looking at them closely, they're chock, of, uh, chock full of really good um, historical information. Sometimes um, we really great finds lead to unexpected connections for us. Um, we're a small staff and like pretty much every archival repository, we have backlog collections that are waiting for us to process and catalog. And this was one hidden gem that we had in our Park and Tree Commission collection. Technically, uh, it was processed, but it wasn't described in a way that made it um, very discoverable to the public. So we were uh, doing a project where we were uh, processing additional records. Um, and so we were going back and looking at that collection and the inventory was fleshed out better. And um, the finding aid that we use for that collection was updated. And so in that project, we found this proposal for Daffin Park that was prepared by the landscape architect, John Nolan in 1907. And it's a, a very small bound report that he submitted to the Park and Tree Commission. And he has a narrative where he says what should be included in the park. He has photographs of, of other parks and other cities that are inspirations, but he also includes photographs of what was already on that land and what was around, around it in the immediate vicinity. So there are pictures of houses like you see on the left. So we know what kind of residences uh, were around there in the area that's now Parkside and Chatham Crescent. And also we know that what is now Daffin Park had a grandstand and racetrack on it. So that was like really cool to have this, all this great documentation. It's a great resource on its own. Um, but as I looked at these pictures, this grandstand was looking really familiar to me. And then I was like, yeah, I've seen that before. I've seen it in this 1902 photograph from the publication artwork of Savannah that we have in our collections. And this photograph, which was labeled racetrack at fairgrounds, had been identified by several people as being the Tenbrock Racetrack. And if you'd heard of the Tenbrock Racetrack, that's a really important site that was on the west side of Savannah. It was the site of the Weeping Time slave sale in the 1950s, I'm sorry, 1850s, which was one of the largest slave sales in the United States. Um, very, very um, terrible event in our history. And so, um, so, this had been identified as Tembrock Racetrack, but when we started comparing the two photographs, um, you know, detail by detail, it was very evident that this was the exact same location. So this was the, the racetrack at Daff, what became Daffin Park. So when we started to look more carefully through other collections, we had using different keywords like fairground. And we found this um, map in the engineering department's map collection and it had been inventoried under fairground track and keywords like Dale Avenue, which was later renamed Victory Drive. So this map dates from 1906. So the discovery of the Nolan um, proposal helped tie together all three of these items from three different collections. And together we learned more about the use of this property before it came, became the Daffin Park we know today and also helped to correct a misidentification, um, which was very important um, for that, uh, that artwork photograph. Um, I had a similar experience with another set of re records also associated with the Park and Tree Commission. These are photographs from our applicants for cemetery lot care. It's long been one of my favorite collections. It's a wonderful collection of photographs of individuals that are identified not only with full names, but often with addresses. So, so often our uh, photographs um, include unidentified individuals. So just having these be identified people is, was enough to get me excited. We knew from our correspondence collections that these photos were submitted by cemetery lot owners to the commission to let them know who would be taking care of their lots and what they looked like. And I've been sharing this collection for years, but recently it took on new meaning. We recently started using the meeting minutes of the Park and Tree Commission a lot more extensively. We found them to be a wealth of information on a wide range of subjects. Um, 
they're not they're not just about the basic maintenance of savannas, parks, and cemeteries and trees. They also reflect the intersection of urban planning and race relations, trends in landscape designs and burial practices, and even details about uh, labor practices. So much so that we just nominated them to be digitized by the Digital Library of Georgia um, to make them more accessible to the public. And as part of that application process, we ran across this tidbit from the October 6, 1919 meeting. And it may be a little hard for you to read, so I'll summarize what this particular caption is saying. So the keeper of Laurel Grove North Cemetery made a statement to the commission saying that certain ladies had been intimidated by lot caretakers. And therefore he issued, quote, a rule allowing no Negroes to enter. And he'd also given strict orders that visits by couples for the purpose of fornication would not be tolerated. The commission in their meeting approved the keeper's actions, which in effect banned blacks from Laurel Grove North Cemetery. But they also received a letter from Miss Stiles, which was read, and she asked that, quote, her old Negro servant be allowed to continue to care for the Habersham lot. So then the commission approved a motion which allowed for permits to be issued for lot care, provided that a photograph was submitted of the person who would perform the work um, that the commission could keep on file. So now we know exactly when this practice of collecting photographs of lot care workers started, why. So, um, so those are just a few of my favorite collections. And these are all, you know, collections are all our babies. So it's hard to choose. So Kelly, could you choose some of your favorites? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm just going to leave these pictures here. Uh, they might be a little bit self-explanatory as to why this collection has always kind of uh, caught our eye. Um, uh, so this is George Gannam, who, while he does happen to be a, a fairly attractive man, um, and he has quite a few archival fangirls who come in to use this collection, um, he's also a very noteworthy figure for Savannah, so we don't want to make too much light of it. Um, <clears throat> George Gannam, he was the first man to die from Chatham County in World War II. Uh, he died during the attacks on Pearl Harbor at only 22 years old. Um, the collection that we hold of his uh, consists primarily of his personal documents, um, personal belongings, and the contents of his military footlocker at the time of his uh, death. And these really tell the story of a young man um, who was, he was a military radio control tower operator, but he was also a Benedictine graduate and he was an amateur photographer. Uh, so having all of these available really just kind of paints the picture um, of a very normal young man, um, just kind of doing normal things young men would do while living in Hawaii or living in Savannah. Um, the collection includes fairly mundane items like his razor and his headphones, um, but also has his snapshots and even his personal camera um, from his photography habit. Uh, we even have his uh, swim trunks that he is wearing in the first image that I showed. Uh, so while not everything in the archives has to be super heavy and historical, um, we can definitely appreciate uh, this handsome historical figure. Uh, but I think it's also really impactful to think about collections as kind of memorials, especially a collection like this, and really kind of what an honor and a privilege it is uh, to be asked by his family to preserve this collection in perpetuity and therefore uh, take care of his memory. <clears throat> So uh, one thing that I do really love about our collections is that even though we don't have kind of the more traditional narrative items like letters or journals that actually tell you stories, um, often when you sit with our indexes or our registers long enough, they really kind of come to life and you start to realize that they actually do tell stories. Um, and so for me, with my curious mind, um, they kind of often take me down a rabbit hole. They almost pose as many questions as they answer sometimes. Um, and so that's one reason that I really particularly like these registers of free persons of color. Uh, prior to the end of slavery, uh, free persons of color over the age of 16 in Savannah were required to register um, annually with the clerk of council. And so these volumes are a documentation of that. Uh, this particular <clears throat> volume includes the name of the free person, the place of residence, their occupation, uh, any property they owned, and the name of their white guardian who was responsible for them. 
Uh, this volume is from 1824, uh, but later volumes also include information about their place of birth um, and date of arrival. So I really <clears throat> appreciate uh, these volumes because they kind of are one of the few places that we get full names of African Americans uh, or even any free person uh, pre-Civil War in our collections. Uh, and they give a snapshot of what life would be like for a free person at that time. They show what occupations are available to somebody and even what levels of economic prosperity they could uh, conceivably achieve. You can even use them to track demographic trends like uh, finding where free persons most commonly lived in the city. Uh, also in a big picture sense, I think it shows that um, even though they were technically quote free, uh, they were really not actually free. So uh, just one particular example, we have this individual, Candy, Candy Prince, um, who lived in the village of St. Gall, which now would be on the western edge of the city, kind of over near Yamacraw. Um, and they worked as a cooper who, or a barrel maker. And it's particularly noteworthy, this individual owned five lots, seven slaves, uh, some which is noted they were tradesmen and three dogs. Uh, so while it's not completely unheard of, uh, and it's actually pretty common for a free person to own a variety of different types of property, um, this individual really sticks out and raises a lot of questions about how the system worked at the time, or at least for me as somebody who is not uh, terribly familiar with the workings of the slavery and freedom systems here. Um, so even the second person under them owned quote, one Negro child slave. Who was this child and what was their relationship to the freed person? Was it their child? If it was their child, couldn't they free their child? The brain, your brain can just spin out a ton of different questions like these. Um, and that's kind of like one of the blessings and curses of being an archivist. Uh, we have all these amazing, fascinating records at our fingertips. Um, but an archivist calling is really to provide access and to identify information and not really be the historian who interprets it, uh, though sometimes we tend to bend the rules in our department a little bit. Um, so we don't really get the time or the uh, ability to kind of answer all these curiosities as much as we would like to. Um, <clears throat> so in a similar vein to the free persons of color and for a similar reason, uh, I think the earliest volumes of our jail registers are really important and fascinating records. Uh, for life as an enslaved person in Savannah. So I don't enjoy uh, linking talking about slavery and to jail or enslaved people to jail records. And I don't mean to imply any kind of uh, link between criminality and enslaved peoples. Um, but I really think uh, this might be the only place where we get exhaustive lists of names for enslaved people in our records. Uh, therefore, they, these records bring them to life as individuals who had feelings and thoughts and opinions and even committed small acts of rebellion, um, and they aren't strictly just notated as property. Um, so these records, they tell us the names of the enslaved person, the name of their owner, their residence, by whom they were surrendered to the jail, um, their offense and remarks, and then a few other fields. Um, a lot of people use these to research linking uh, the slave owner to the enslaved people that they owned. Um, but I really think they're really significant because they also paint a picture of what constituted a criminal offense for an enslaved person. Um, in these examples, we see offenses including running, riding, being drunk, and having no ticket, which seem, again, very fairly minor, uh, minor offenses but at the time being uh, warranted being turned over to jail. Um, so you also maybe see this uh, notation that's an SK. Uh, this is one that kind of stumped us at first until a researcher clued us in that this actually stood for safekeeping, uh, which is a system where for a fee, uh, slave owners or slave brokers could check their enslaved people into the jail while they went out of town or perhaps before they were sold at auction or were brokers passing through town uh, could store them. Uh, so these individuals committed no violations, but yet they were still held in jail at their owner's convenience. Uh, I think an estimated 50% of all enslaved uh, people held in jail in Savannah at this time were held for safekeeping. 
Um, so while most of the records do indicate the aforementioned running, riding, etc., cetera, uh, sometimes some uh, jump out at you as well and kind of really make you want to know the story of exactly maybe what happened there, uh, such as this individual who was jailed for attempting to poison. I'm sure there's quite the story there. Um, so now to pivot a little bit, I wanted to share about our cash books uh, from the city treasurer's office. Uh, these volumes record cash paid and received uh, for contracted services um, and purchases by the city. And they're another great example where uh, details can kind of be sussed out that are really interesting um, out of what would otherwise kind of seem to be a fairly boring accounting ledger. Uh, so the examples I've included here uh, relate to President Monroe's visit to Savannah in 1819 to uh, celebrate the launch of the SS Savannah. So if you came to me and you said, I want to research President Monroe's uh, visit to Savannah, I would tell you the most logical place to start would be with the newspapers to get those narrative documentary accounts. But like, let's just say you're a big uh, fan of the municipal archives and you were really dying to come in, see things for yourself, get your hands on some old books. Uh, these records are actually a really great place to tell you a lot of those little details for an event like this. So for example, we have an expenditure of $100 for a carriage rental used for the reception of the president, uh, $50 for a musical band, $73 for diapers, uh, and more for the president's household. So there you could even kind of maybe determine that he was probably traveling with children. Um, and then we have on this page uh, almost $400 for repairing the house intended for the president to stay in, uh, which for the record was the Scarborough House, which was finished in 1819 by architect William J. Um, just in time for the president to visit. Um, so one of the more interesting kind of ephemeral details about the president's visit, which you can read about in the newspaper, um, is that a temporary structure was built in Johnson Square for hosting uh, a gala or a ball. Uh, so on this page, we see and we get a little bit more information. Um, the city has paid $500 to Mr. J, who is actually architect William J, uh, for rooms and a ball and dinner for the president. So if you read that and you didn't necessarily know that they built this ephemeral structure, you might think that they were renting rooms, but putting those two pieces and these two kind of uh, research documents together, you get kind of a really interesting uh, idea of the esteem and how important this visit was for the city. I think the total budget for this event was $5,000, which in 1819 money is quite a, quite a lot. Um, so. This is just one such example of an event that these records would be beneficial in researching. But really, overall, I think this collection is actually one of our most underutilized because people write it off as just a boring accounting ledger um, and don't realize what kind of rich details it actually holds. So the concept of underutilized collections is something else that we had wanted to touch on tonight. I already mentioned that I thought the Park and Tree Commission minutes have been underutilized and you just brought up the cash books. Are there any other collections that you think researchers are not using to their full potential? Yes. Um, so to, <coughs> excuse me, to jump to like a completely different era of history, I really think the Metropolitan Planning Commission slide collection does not get the use that it uh, that it really deserves. So this is a newer collection to us. Um, so I'll chalk it up to that, that it's not being fully utilized. Um, but uh, so this collection consists of over 6,300 slides of historic buildings, streetscapes, neighborhoods, and more. And it came to us fully digitized and fully cataloged. So that's basically like the holy grail for an archivist to receive a collection that way. Um, and that's all thanks to the hard work of the Metropolitan Planning Commission Historic uh, Preservation Division staff. Um, so these images show buildings being built in their current state, pre, during, and post renovations. Um, I think this collection is really significant for us uh, because it's almost encyclopedic in its thoroughness and the way that it's cataloged. It's cataloged by street, by block, and then you can physically almost walk down the street using the images in the collection. And you can walk down the street and see it at different moments in time. So it's uh, really amazing from that perspective. 
uh, but also it uh, fills in a significant 20th century gap for us. Uh, the later part of the 20th century is uh, kind of one of our, our weaker spots, um, especially for photographs. Um, and a lot of people come to us to research their properties. So these images have a focus in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so we're able to provide them um, to fill in those gaps. Uh, what about you, Luchana? Are there any other underutilized collections that you think people should know about? Yeah, so, you know, I think going along that line of pe what people think is just kind of boring, um, the city code books don't get their due. So the city codes are all the city ordinances or local laws that are on the books at a given point in time, and then they're published together. We have several versions of the code books starting in 1854, basically all the way up to present. Um, and they're just a wealth of information about what was important to a com the community at that time. The laws follow trends in public health and safety, social issues, economics, and more. And you can use them to see not only what was going in in Savannah at the time, but how does Savannah pit fit in with national trends in the national picture? So here is an excerpt from the 1854 Code Books Index. Um, and you can see the breadth of topics. So it featured everything from ordinances about abducting semen to uh, apothecary prescriptions to badges for free Negroes, which would be free people of color, which you were just discussing, um, and badges for selling things at the market or badges if you were slaves. Um, so really covering the gamut of topics. Um, here is an example also from the 1858 book of the two ordinances that were in effect at that time related to swimming. So one ordinance had been passed in 1839, which made it unlawful for any person to swim or bathe in the Savannah River opposite the city. Um, and um, between the hours of 7 a.m. and sunset, so you could swim after sunset all, all the way till the morning time again. Um, and the second ordinance was passed in 1857, which was the same, made it unlawful to swim or bathe in the Ogeechee Canal between the second lock and where it dumped into the river. Um, and it also, for both of them, violations of both ordinances would be met up with a fine of $50 for a white person or 50 lashes for a slave or a free person of color. So these two ordinances um, tell you how the river and canal were used for bathing and that it was acceptable to bathe in them as long as you were doing it at certain hours of the day. And also what was considered acceptable punishment for different groups of people at that time. So, you know, looking at sometimes, you know, on your face value, you might say, oh, it's just about swimming. But if you really get into it, into the meat of the ordinances. Um, so as as Kelly and I have used the code books to respond to reference requests over the years, we are always seeing interesting little things catching our eyes, and we've long talked about sharing them with the public. So this year, we launched a new series called Obscure Ordinances. We've, we've just done a couple so far, but we highlight an interesting or odd city ordinance with, along with a little bit of historical background about why it came to be or how it fits into national or international movements. Um, for example, this month we featured um, the 1922 ordinance that outlawed jazz dancing in Savannah. And it's been a great opportunity for us to introduce people to the city code books, um, as well as just, you know, share some historical information about Savannah with them. So um, Kelly, obscure ordinances really grew out of, I think, this crazy and unusual 2020 year. And you pulled the final idea of it together. So do you want to say anything else about this initiative? Yeah, so I wanted to talk in general kind of about how COVID has really impacted what we do. But I do want to share uh, this particular obscure ordinance, the first one I think that we shared, um, which had to do with the requirements to wear wool socks while in the powder magazine. And so we asked people, why do you think people had to wear socks in the powder magazine? Um, and this probably got like the most far reaching engagement that we've had. Uh, people were doing research for themselves. They were reaching out to us and telling us about times they visited military sites. They were reaching out to their high school ROTC teachers to try to figure out why uh, somebody would wear wool socks in the powder magazine. And so that's really what we're trying to go for. We're trying to get people to think about these 
um, kind of things more uh, more in depth and get them used to kind of archival and historical thought. Um, we've been doing a lot of social media since the uh, pandemic. And so that's kind of also been a bit of a learning experience for us. Uh, Facebook comment sections can be uh, rough at times. So we've kind of had to thicken our skin a little bit. Um, but this this comment here uh, kind of wins my favorite Facebook comment on one of our posts. Uh, I'll have a medical condition. I'll not wear woolen socks in Ye Magazine. So I think that kind of uh, really spearheads what's going on in the world right now. Um, <clears throat> but Aside from that, so in general, like I said, during the pandemic for everybody, no matter who you are, this has really been a, a time of adapting and learning and growing. Um, and so I've kind of really actually appreciated that about us. It's, it's uh, about this. It sort of pushed me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, I'm definitely not an educator and I'm not hugely savvy on social media. I really just post a lot of pictures of my like cats. Uh, so to learn and grow and find new ways to reach our audiences has been kind of a really rewarding experience for me, I think. Uh, so in addition to some of the series that we've done, we also just try to share new collections as they come out. Um, so we shared this Minus collection, which was uh, Glass Plate Negatives. And this, I think, got the most likes and shares of anything that we posted. Um, but what I really enjoyed about it is people were in the comment section kind of really thinking critically about these images what's in her head? Is it crabs? Is it turnips? But then also remarkably, she's a very young girl and that's a whole bunch of something crunching down on her neck. So they're actually kind of putting themselves in the place of these young girls and empathizing with them. Uh, so that kind of engagement just like really makes my little archivist heart super happy. <clears throat> um, so another series on social media that we've really, it's been a bit of a labor of love for us uh, is our Amazing Savannah Women series. Uh, where we profile a different Amazing Savannah woman on the last Thursday of each month. Uh, we started doing this to commemorate the 100th anniversary of uh, women's suffrage, but it's actually kind of turned into something more. Um, on one hand, it, you'd be surprised at how much research uh, goes into putting together a little 200-word uh, biography of somebody. Um, but so this uh, this series also kind of exposed Luciana and I to some of our own blind spots, uh, communities that we're less familiar with, and the blind spots in our collection. Um, and it has re caused us to reach out to underrepresented communities in our collection. Uh, in particular, so far, we've uh, reached out to the LGBTQ plus community and the Hispanic and Latinx communities um, by way of the various city task forces. Um, and we reached out to start with to identify women to spotlight from those communities, but we're really hoping that it helps us build relationships with these and make sure that we are documenting them as uh, much as possible in the future in the archives. So uh, in addition to social media, we've also done some other outreach activities or, or beefed them up. Uh, to meet our changing audience needs. The Archives Alive series um, is a primary resource educational activity that we were developing pre-COVID to deliver in person in the archives. Uh, but when everybody started going to school remotely, uh, we've made it available completely online. Um, and we, so we sort of had to pivot. Uh, since City Hall is no longer open to tours uh, for the foreseeable future, we've developed youth activity sheets like a scavenger hunt or the city hall activity sheet. And we've also tried to um, keep current by putting on new programs such as this going viral Spanish flu in Savannah, which was a hopefully timely or not timely, I guess, depending, uh, presentation on the last major pandemic to hit Savannah. Um, so this has kind of been one of my uh, more interesting undertakings in my time, Luciana. Like, what about you? Do you? What are some of your favorite projects? Okay. So, um, probably the largest and most emotionally satisfying project I've ever worked on um, since I've been with the city was assisting with the planning and implementation of the World War II monument on River Street. It started when I was um, tasked with completing historical research on Savannah's involvement in World War II to help the community determine if River Street 
was an appropriate location um, for the monument. So here's uh, just one of the research reports that I did for that. Um, then I was tasked to work with the Chatham County Veterans Council to develop criteria and vet all the names that would be engraved on the monument to ensure that everybody that should be on the monument made it on the monument and then all the names would be spelled right. Um, and that effort involved about nine months of uh, work that included historical research, reaching out to family members, and resulted in sort of this documentation you see here on every person that we researched. Um, and um, as the city staff liaison to them, I helped the council shepherd the monument through the approval process. And after it was dedicated, and here's a picture of the monument um, down on River Street, it was extremely moving for me to be able to go down to the monument and see people walk through and look at the names and touch the names, and read the names, and, um, and know the stories that went behind every, every one of those names. So there's a story of sacrifice for every one of those names engraved on that monument. Um, and knowing how, the, how or why, um, unfortunately, they did not come back to Savannah. So all of that research that went into assisting in the project um, ended up being compiled into a research collection that's now at the Municipal Archives, and it's taken on a second life. Um, so, you know, the whole purpose was to get this monument built and get those names on the walls down there. But now we have family members and historians that come back to us um, to, to ask about names and to get information about their family members. So each time I can provide a family member the service information for someone that's represented on that monument, it's really satisfying all over again for me. So do you have a project that sticks out with you since the time you've been with the city? Uh, yeah, so in a similar vein, and I think uh, you were inspired by your World War II work to undertake this for World War I, um, but I really, really enjoyed working on the World War I Centennial Project. Um, this is almost a year plus long uh, project. Uh, in 2018, we prepared two public presentations with uh, research into many different facets of World War I and how it impacted Savannah as well as a physical exhibit uh, in the City Hall Rotunda and the Council Chambers. And we hosted an intern who did a really comprehensive World War I um, documentation project where she documented all of the names and of the individuals on the World War I monument in Daffin Park. Um, and so this was really fun because this was uh, one of the few options, few opportunities where I've had to really kind of sink my teeth into a research project and really uh, kind of roll around uh, in the historical documentation. I really loved researching the various ways that the war impacted Savannah, not only just in the military ways, but how it also uh, impacted from a social and political one. Um, when we decided to do the uh, council chamber exhibit, Luchana reached out to the community and asked for loans from items from their personal collections. Uh, so we had all kinds of citizens uh, loaning us amazing things like this trench art item. Um, and so to really involve the community into it and see the way that it was supported in that way was also uh, really satisfying for me. So one of my favorite things that kind of came out of this was actually about a year after the project was completed um, we, like I said, uh, did a lot of research on the actual individuals who, especially those who were uh, killed in action during World War I. Um, and so one gentleman that I had researched uh, extensively and found a lot of documentation on was Joseph Francis Bohan. Um, we even put his Siemens protection certificate that I have here on one of our exhibit panels. Uh, so in early 2020, I think it was, a gentleman came in to research the Bohan family, uh, who they have connections to city aldermen and other influential events around the city. Uh, and so I asked him if they were the same Bohans as this Joseph Francis, and uh, lo and behold, he was. Uh, <clears throat> so Mr. Willoughby was uh, generous enough to share this family portrait uh, of the Bohans that has Joseph Francis as a young child in it. But he also shared uh, that our documentation that I was so excited to have a photo of uh, Joseph from Ancestry.com was not actually the real Joseph. 
Um, he clued us in that the portraits in these documents were actually on the back of the certificates. So even though Ancestry tells you that the whole page was his record, it was not. And so you have to flip the page to see it. Uh, so now we know that this is actually uh, Joseph Francis Bohan. And I think now you can kind of see the family resemblance. So even though that was a little bit of a kind of eating crow moment for me, it was really nice uh, to have that kind of engagement with the community and get it right. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I really, really uh, did a lot of research on the Gold Star Mothers pilgrimages in World War I, uh, where mothers and wives were um, of those lost in the war were invited to travel to Europe and visit their loved ones, um, their final resting place. So I had pulled Joseph Francis Bohan's file from the National Archives uh, that included his mother's invitation um, on the pilgrimage, as well as her letter turning it down uh, that she couldn't attend for health reasons. Um, so when Mr. Willoughby came in, I was actually able to share his entire National Record or National Archive service file with him, uh, which included why his mother didn't go. He was familiar that she'd been invited, but he didn't know why she didn't go. Um, and in turn, he shared this image of the Savannah Gold Star Mothers at the Savannah Municipal Auditorium with us. Uh, this placard also shows the names that would later end up on the World War I monument in Daffin Park. Um, so again, it was just like a really cool, if somber moment of tying all this research together and being able to connect this research with Savannah today, more, you know, 100 plus years later, and to have this in exchange of information with the community. So it really just kind of drives home how important the work that we do is to the community and how much of a community archives we really at least are striving to be. Um, so this was kind of a, an aha moment for me. Uh, what about you, Luciana? Have you had any sort of exciting moments where all of your research came together? Yeah, so um, I think your aha moment was more about the community. Mine was a little bit more internal to the city um, the city organization. So um, archivists tend to get a little attached to their matter and even sort of feel like they know the people in their records, even if they died over a century ago, particularly attached to our map collections, which I think are hands down fabulous. Um, and many of those maps and surveys are signed by this gentleman, city surveyor John B. Hogg. Um, but in May 1879, um, he decided to change his name to John B. Howard. So, and the city collections document that changed all the drawings he started signing um, that way. City council now started referring to him as John B. Howard, but nothing in our records said why. Um, so they did say John B. Hogg is now John B. Howard. So that was very clear. So all of the years I had worked for the city, I wondered what, what had happened. Did he just not like being called Hog? Um, but I really didn't have time to figure it out. Um, then there was this guy, uh, John W. Howard. He became city engineer in 1906. And I wondered if there was some family connection between them. Um, and But the little bit of research I did never answered was that question either. So in 2018, we did an outreach program and I decided it was time to really buckle down and do the dirty research work. Um, in the end, after a lot of research, it actually came down to just a little bit of luck and just the right connection. So uh, I pretty quickly found out that in 1879, Hogg, his wife and his children legally changed their name in Chatham County Superior Court. And they just simply stated that they wanted their family name to correspond with their relatives who had already changed theirs. Um, they did have a son that was John W., so he became John W. Howard, and I thought maybe he was our engineer, but research um, indicated his middle name was Wyndham, and our engineer's middle name was Webb, so I thought that was the end of the story, um, and they, that they were not related, or so I thought. Um, and then I found this little family genealogy that was, that was written by our city engineer, John Webb Howard, which outlined his whole family tree. Um, and that went all the way back to George Hogg from England, and his grandson, James Hogg Jr., decided to change his name to Howard, which led to two family lines. One went by Hogg, and one went by Howard. So our John B. Hogg, who later renamed himself John B. Howard, and then John Webb Howard from the two separate lines, um, were in fact cousins. 
So John Webb Howard, who went by Guy, had written this family history. And in it, he included how he came to work in the Savannah City Surveyor's Office. And quote, he said, the compiler of this record came to Savannah, April 1886, to work in the office of John B. Hogg Howard and lived with his family until his death, March 24th, 1888. Cousin John, as our family called him, held the office of city surveyor for many years. With his soft, congenial manners, friendly spirit, and Christian character was loved by everyone in Savannah. And so my hunt and mystery was finally over. John B. Hogg became Howard because he wanted to match the rest of his family, which included his cousin Guy, um, and who came to live with him and work with him for the city of Savannah organization. So that was just really exciting for me. You know, you wonder about something for years and years, and then all of a sudden, you, you, it all comes together. So um, I think I could speak for Kelly when I say that we both really enjoy what we do and working for the city. And many days our work seems like play as we get to help people use our fabulous collections, whether they're seeking out individuals or discovering the history of their home or tackling some larger issue about Savannah's history. Um, we hope you've enjoyed a little peek at some of our favorites or a little insight into our work and why we do it. Um, and we are happy to answer any questions you have about our collections or the archives. So I'll look to see if anybody put anything in the Q&A uh, first. So um, Nick says, wow, do you have anything related to the March 1825 Marquis de Lafayette's visit. Um, let's see, I bet we have some similar things to what Kelly found in the cash books um, related to if the city outlaid any monies for the Marquis de Lafayette's visit. And also in the city um, council meeting minutes, um, I would think city council would have discussed the um, the visit and how they were going to interact with Marquis de Lafayette. Um, at a minimum, I would say those would be the two resources that we would probably check first um, for that time period. Let's see. Um, okay. Let's see. If anybody has any, um, I think that's all we have in in there, if anybody has any questions that they would like to say out loud, they could uh, raise their hand and I can um, unmute you. Or I can just unmute everybody. Let me see if I know how to do that. I don't know if I know how to do that. Oh. I'm just allowing people to talk, but you have to unmute yourself if you would like to talk. Oh, apparently, okay. Okay, Laurel is using an older version of Zoom. So if Laurel would like to say anything, I guess you will have to chat, uh, put it in Q&A. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Hi, Glenda. Glenda. Okay. Um, Glenda, you're unmuted, I think, or I see. I'm trying to unmute you. You can unmute yourself, Glenda. Okay, did I unmute myself? Did it work? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, my question is, um, what has been your most so far available to the public? Okay, I think you went out for minutes. Can you repeat it? Okay, um, so far, what has been your most interesting use of the WW Law collections that are processed and available to date? would you say? Who? Well, um, we've had more student use of it, of them, I would say. Um, and some exhibit use. We have, um, 
A couple of projects that are going on right now, Tybee's working on a marker about wait-ins. So they just reached out to us to get uh, documentation um, about the wait-ins at Tybee. Um, the beach is there. So I'm kind of excited to see what they do with the information we provided them. Um, we have, we actually have an intern right now um, that's working with us, which has been a challenge. We had, we had two really good internships lined up and they dropped off because they couldn't come in, in live. So now we have two new interns that are doing remote internships and one is doing, um, gonna be working on an exhibit for children using the WW Law photograph collection. Um, and she's just gotten started. I'm excited to see what she's gonna do since she wants to gear it more towards children. Um, Kelly, what uh, what do you, anything come to your mind right now? Um, well, I just uh, Law and Preservation Week. That was uh, pretty shortly after I came here, so I don't know all that went into it, but it was kind of a, it was a, a nice culmination of a lot of different aspects of his life, especially the preservation one, which uh, doesn't get talked about as much as some of the others. Um, yeah, so the Law and Preservation Week, we, we got a proclamation for, from City Council for that, and we did a week-long activity where we did something each day of the week. We had, um, one day we did tours in the Beach Institute, one day we did a tour in Laurel Grove Cemetery, one day we did a, a panel, a talking panel that we partnered with Historic uh, Savannah Foundation on um, that included an exhibit um, that was really cool because it featured panelists who had worked with him in preservation. So they had firsthand knowledge and experience of working with Mr. Law in preservation. And then we did an online exhibit, which is still up, um, that features items from the law collection about preservation work. Um, I think people focused on his work as the NAACP president and don't realize how much he did to preserve history and buildings and historical sites, um, not just after he left, not, af not just after he stopped being president of the NAACP in 1976, but the entire time, I think his entire adult life, he was fighting for recognition of uh, African-American and black history. And um, that was kind of his civil rights work too. So yeah, that's, that was huge. Um, my, my favorite was your music exhibit that you did of all his music at the beach. I think it was at the Beach Institute. I can't even remember which year, but that was such an outstanding um, look into his life, aspects of his life that are not were not necessarily that well known to the entire general public. I just okay. I found that I found that exhibit really interesting. I wondered if any musicians might have used any of that collection since then for you know, various research projects or any books or anything like that. Well, thank you for bringing up that exhibit. I want to give a big shout out to Rita Elliott, who is our exhibit designer for that. Um, but I also think you raise a good point. Um, the WW Law Collection, unfortunately, I think is probably a underutilized collection still. Um, we are constantly trying to highlight it. Um, I don't think it's getting the use it should be getting. So mm -hmm. if you'd like to talk it up all over town, um, all over the state, please do. Because it's well, I, I, you know, I have the opportunity. <laughs> I, think we are, I think we need to bring it to Michael Thurman's attention and tell him that he needs to write some more books. <laughs> all right. Um, anybody else have any other questions? You can type them in or raise your hand. Okay. Well, um, if nobody has any other questions, we are um, really happy you came out for Archives Month and um, hope you enjoyed uh, the program. Um, and we look forward to engaging more with you. Um, both virtually and um, hopefully in person again soon. Um, and, and have a good evening.